59. Here's Michael Behe. The question then becomes, are there irreducibly complex systems in the cell? Yes, there are many. Absolutely. As I said, uh, it's, uh, the cell is chock full of machines. Machines need many parts. They can't be built by numerous successive slight modifications. But let me draw attention to one little sneaky trick that Darwin put into that quotation. He says, if it could be demonstrated that something couldn't possibly happen. Right. So he's putting a burden on his opponents to prove a negative, which science cannot do and never has. No theory has ruled out all rival theories uh, to be accepted. But we have great evidence and, uh, that it can't, and we have absolutely no, no evidence that uh, natural selection acting on random mutation could build much of anything. So, so here's, here's the objection. The objection. I say this as if I know enough to be authoritative. Here's an objection. And the objection runs, all right. It's very hard to see how you evolve a mousetrap beginning with a little wooden platform. And uh, True. It can't work until all the pieces are in place. On the other hand, suppose you do evolve it in two or three pieces and they sit around for centuries. They don't confer any advantage on the organism, but they don't harm it either. So they're just they're these strange accretions on which natural selection is neutral. It doesn't select for them, but it doesn't select against them. And then after eons and eons, we worry about the maths later, after eons and eons, the final piece drops into place and suddenly it functions. Plausible? Uh, uh, no, that's ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, realistically, uh, would you... He have has, he's, being, <laughs> he's being very careful of Darwin, but he's swatting me aside. Yeah. Right, go, go ahead. <laughs> no, if, if you think... You know, suppose you didn't have a mousetrap. So you say, well, let me, what can I do? I'll just go into my garage and pick out a few pieces that would function uh, as a mousetrap. And you say, well, I need a spring. Well, here's one in this grandfather clock I have. You know, you wind right. up, I'll just use that. And I need, a, I need a hammer to squash the mouse. I'll use this crowbar over here. But the pieces don't, aren't adjusted to each other. You can't just take random pieces and put them together. And natural selection, which, as Darwin said, is, is constantly scrutinizing life, would not be expected to make things in the shape that they would need to be for some future use. They would only, uh, they would hone them for what they were doing right now. All right. Can, can I weigh in on sure, this? Sure, of course. Because there's a connection between what Mike's talking about and the mathematical problems that John was alluding to. And that is that in these actual systems, these nanomachines that Mike has made famous through his work, for example, the bacterial flagellar motor or the ATP synthase, one's a, one's a this rotary. This has made the flagellar motor a rock star. Well, he kind of has. He kind yes, of he has. has. But it's, you know, it's a 30-part rotary engine. The ATP synthase is a turbine with multiple parts. But the parts are made of proteins. And proteins are the... In, in essence, the toolbox of the cell. That they, they perform specific functions in view of their three-dimensional shapes. So they make the parts of molecular machines. They function as enzymes to catalyze reactions at super fast rates. Uh, they help process information. But if you were to, to, to build a, a, a system like the flagellar motor, you need 30 proteins that fit together in an, in an integrated fashion. But that requires genetic code. Each one of those proteins requires a long stretch of genetic information to build the protein. And so what you're talking about is not just, you know, some bent hammer or something sitting around doing nothing. You're talking about a need for genetic information that's, that is sufficient to overcome these long odds against, uh, against building the protein in the first place. So it'd be like, to change the metaphor slightly, a gigantic a uh, haystack the size of the North American continent, and you're only allowed to search one ten thirty seventh of the of the, the continent, maybe a tiny little square of Southern California. When, if that's the case, are you more likely or less likely to to find the needle? To, to find the needle, and you're and, and the answer is you're overwhelmingly more likely not to find the needle than to find it. Which is to say, the mutation selection mechanism lacks the creative power to generate new biological it lacks information. Close to the creative. Exactly, and that's for one that's protein. One proteins out of thirteen proteins necessary to make the waving little tail, which is only one machine. Um, All right. Yeah. And that, in a sense, is before you said anything about the fact that the information required is linguistic. 
and linguistic language is not produced by random processes. And right. uh, this is a hugely linguistic, important you can't thing. What you mean well, by that? It's take linguistic the, in the way the take DNA, the human yeah, genome code. exactly. Ah, yes, code, right. the human genome is the longest word we've ever discovered, and we can call it a word because it's written in a, a chemical language of, of four letters. And all those letters, strung out like a computer program, have got to be in the right order, otherwise it breaks down. I mean, most programs, if you change a letter, that's the end of the program. So we're dealing with something absolutely gigantic in terms